right, context is roughly in the early 800s BC, between 800 and 840 BC, because that's the reign of this guy, Joash, or Yehoash. Often, by the way, if you hear someone's name, this is just because it gets so complicated. The North and the South have so conspired against each other, and yet somehow it's sort of converged in such ways that half of the kings of this particular season are named the same thing at both sides. So that just, boy, that doesn't make it more confusing. So there is an added ho often, and it's actually the same. Uh, in other words, you can hear Yoash or Yahoash, it's the same name. But sometimes what they'll do is they'll add that to one side so you can kind of remember that's the Joho versus the Joe. And that's and really the idea of that is, and there's certain names you can do that with. It's like saying Ben and Benjamin would be kind of the idea, or Sam and Samuel. So let's pray. And we are looking at the southern area, specifically of the boy king. Lord, I just pray that uh, we've come. Lord, you know every speck of dust under our shoes. You know, Lord, everything that uh, we encounter. You know every struggle we have right now. You know every confusion. You know every battle we face. You know everything we claim is victory that we should or shouldn't. And I just pray that this would really meet us exactly where we're at and we go, oh my goodness, that was exactly what I needed. <laughs> so Lord, redeem this time now. That every minute would be perfectly spent. We just commit this to you. Pray that you would immerse me in your Holy Spirit and that you would do the work now. Take my lips and attach them to your heart. And take our ears and open them up now to receive what it is you have for us. Captivate us in your word and may we have so much fun being equipped and drawn into it. And Lord, I pray that we would recognize the beauty of choosing, the dignity of choice of saying yes to your offer. In Jesus' name. The kingdom is divided roughly on this closer side of 1000 BC, in the 900s BC. There are 19 kings in the north, there are 20 kings in the south. And the 19 kings in the north, not a single one of them is good. Uh, in the south, we have these vacillating situations of kings that were doing fairly well or not. During all of this time, there is one queen, and that's this woman, Natalia. She is the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab, who is the previous king of Israel. She is the sister of the current king of Israel. His name is Yehoram. She is the mother of Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So think about this, that both the north and the south have this woman in common. Again, I remind you, she is the sister of the guy in the north, and she is the mother of the guy in the south. But there is a man named Yehu. Yehu! And Yehu, by the way, kills the Israeli brother, who is the king up in the north, and he assumes the throne there. Again, yeah, but he also kills the king of the south, that's her son, but, that, but leaves it as a, as, a, as a vacancy. Atalia now, grieving mother, does what any horrible grieving mother should never do, and that is she kills the rest of her children and grandchildren, or so she thinks, and assumes the throne. Uh, this just sounds like just about any race for the throne, and might I just say, in the simplest sense, it's the epitome of a dysfunctional family. When grandma's like, hey, look, everyone, grandma's over, I, I, and she tries to kill everyone, that is definitely an unhealthy family. But one grandson, just one, though God had promised that through the lineage of this King David, there would come the Messiah, one of the requirements, one of the over 338 different prophecies of the first coming of Jesus, and yet in that, he has to come from this lineage. Had this boy been wiped out, that would have been the end of it. But this boy is a year old, and he is rescued. His name is Yoash, or if you wish, Yehoash, uh, just the same. And he's rescued by the high priest's wife. Her name is Yehosheba. And he is hidden in the one place grandma would never go, the temple. You see, she had ransacked and looted the temple so that she could take all of its goods and help build from that a temple to the false god Baal. So that's what she's done. And so for the next six years, this one-year-old grows up, l hidden in the temple precinct, raised by the high priest, and his name is a cool name, Yehoiada. Uh, to this day, Ada means to know, Yada means to know. If someone was talking to you in, Isra in Hebrew, uh, in Israel, one of the first things you might want to learn is, Ani lo yuda, or Ani lo yudea, it all depends on whether it's a man or a woman. And what that means is, I don't know. In other words, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, yada means to know. 
Yeho is God. So Yehoyada means, in the simplest sense, oh God knows. So Yehoyada and his wife, Yehoshiva, which means God has a covenant or God is committed, have raised this boy for the next six years. So imagine, that's the people who were overseeing all of this. Now, at age seven, that's six years later, I'll tell you again, is, is looted the temple. Yehoash has reached age seven, and the high priest, Yehoiada, has arranged a coup. He is going to get that king on the throne. And I can remind you, he's at seven years old. All right. At seven, Yehoiada arranges a coup. And the way he does it is during a Shabbat shift change. You see, during Shabbat, it's sort of like in our, our Sundays back 100 years ago here when lots of people went to church. Well, that was kind of the idea. And what happened is everyone sort of had their times. So the one time when you'd have the most priests or Levites was the time when one crew was getting off shift and the next crew was coming on. Then you have two-thirds of the shift. And so he basically arranges at that time. They bring out the boy. Then she discovers she's in deep water. That's the queen at the moment. She screams high treason. And uh, they take her outside of the temple area and gangster granny is killed. And now this boy becomes the youngest boy in the history of Judean kingdom. Uh, as a king, he takes the throne at age seven. And that takes us to chapter 12. That kind of leads us into it. A seven-year-old boy is reigning on the throne because he's certainly going to do a better job than his sick old grandmother. I remind you, in the north, the king there is a guy named Yahu, who has killed the king prior to take the throne. So in the seventh year of Yahu, Yehoash became king. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. Now, simple math on this. He's going to die at the end of that. How old is Yehoash when he dies? Think of it this way. He started reigning at age 7, and he reigns for 40 years. He's 47 years old. Now, I know this is probably going to amaze you all. But that's younger than I am. All right, anyway. <laughs> and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia. Zibia, by the way, Zibia means a female gazelle of Beersheba. So it's actually a pretty good thing. Now, Yehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Yehoiada the priest instructed him. This becomes the signature emblemized statement for all of Yehoash's life. And might I say, this is the point. Now, in God's kindness, this Yehoiada is going to live 130 years. He's going to live quite long. You know what, to be honest? Even 15 years ago, a couple of us are old enough to remember that long ago. Uh, even 15 years ago, when you started talking about people living 130 years, people thought you were actually making that up. And now they're finding people that are, that someone just died, they were 132 in Spain. And there's this place in Italy, have you heard about this? There's this one particular place in Italy where everybody lives past 100 years old. And it's, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't know, pardon me, because it's kind of like a leper colony. In a sense, you go in there, you're the youngest one and you're looking at your future. But, um, but hey, they're, they're, you know, and they're like, you know, they're 105 playing volleyball. There's just, it's just the weirdest thing. Yeah. It sounds like some kind of weird movie. But I'm calling this, if I dare call it, the Yehoyada complex. Proximity faith. And here's the idea. That this man has a fantastic role model. He has a fantastic role model in Yehoiada, who, by the way, I remind you, has not only he and his wife rescued this boy right from the beginning, from gangster granny, but he, but he has also arranged the coup to put him on the throne. And he is obviously has a very great concern for that. And this guy is roughly 100 years old or so at this particular point, which means he saw Amri, he saw Ahab, he saw Eliyah, he saw Elisha. He's watched all of this, and he's going to live another 20, 25 years at this particular point when we see this. And, and I just want you to recognize, even with that, and you have somebody, and, and look, at, there's nothing wrong with having somebody you can really look up to that can encourage you in the Lord, but sooner or later, your faith has got to become your own. Sooner or later, it's going to come to the point where they're not going to be in your life like they used to be. And that's actually a good thing. 
I recognize that as a parent. I have two daughters. That's no surprise to you. And our, we knew from the moment that, we, that they were given to us, because one's born and one's adopted in North Heaven, that, they were, that our mission was not to make them live in complete reliance of us. Now, granted, in the beginning, that's necessary, but you hope to build those decision-making machines in them so that they can actually function without you having to be there to hold their hand for everything, or in essence, you really haven't helped raise them. And as a pastor, I recognize that that can be the case. There are certain societies out there where the mission is to make you rely on them for the rest of your life. I have friends that work in specific breeds and areas and functions of counseling where they've been with the same people for 40 years. Because it's like the mission is never to make them independent, which seems to me crazy. And if as a discipler, as a person who wants to invest in you, I want to see what a place where you can function with your own faith in the Lord. I would love to be an example for as long as I can, God would have me be an example to you. But in the end of it all, you've got to have your own faith. And unfortunately, what this chapter is going to show us, why partial reformation will never work. And here's the problem with all of this. God has already forebode us, if you will, foreshadowed us in verse 2, with the idea that as long as Yehoiada is going to be around and instructing him, this guy is going to be solid. And can I just say it in the simplest sense? Because ultimately what's going to happen is, spoiler alert, Yehoiada is going to die somewhere in all of this. Now, at 100 years old, you see it coming sooner or later. And can I just say, in a very dangerous thing, as your friend, please have a faith that is deeper than one that can be shattered by the death of anyone in your family, in your life, whatsoever. You've got to have a faith deeper than that. Because like it or not, every one of us is going to stand before God sooner or later in your faith leaning on that individual wasn't going to be there forever regardless of who that person is. And look at what it says here in regards to the temporary. There's going to be two very fundamental aspects of that. It says in verse 2, Yehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Yehoiada the priest instructed him. Wouldn't you love God say to you of, you know, Sharon did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of her life. Not all the days that her friend was around or whatever. I mean, it's like, wouldn't you love that? I'm like, God, you know, thank you. You're not writing scripture right now because I think I'd be afraid to read the chapter you write about. But it says in verse 3, But the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And here is the one of two things that are going to become clear in this as an emblem of compromised reform. And that is that the people in the south, very different from the people in the north, the people in the south were were trying to do what was right to some degree, but they were only a church, if you will, of convenient sacrifice. There was a specific prescribed place where God wanted his people to congregate to sacrifice together. And understand, first of all, sacrifice is the fundamental aspect of it. We don't come to church like it's shopping. We come to fellowship with the intent of being available to be used. And that becomes the problem, one of the fundamental problems between going to the one place God has ordained for it, a place where fellowship is congregational among people, and a place where you kind of just do it whenever, however you want, on a mountain somewhere by yourself. And understand, the way that the, the Hebrew in this is not that they did both. It's that they did the other instead of. I mean, in other words, God doesn't have a problem with you getting alone with the Lord and worshiping in your room. Dance and flit and spin around and speak in tongues and do anything and everything that you know is going to bless you and God in that process. But he doesn't, but he, he requires us to not forsake the assembling of each other because one of the things he wants in that is for us to be able to try out ministry on each other because this is a group of people that have to forgive you. So this is a really best test market for it. So you feel like the Lord's put a word on your heart? Well, then go ahead and share it with someone. And you're like, well, what if I'm wrong? Well, then good, tell them. Don't, you don't have to believe me in that. Test it yourself because it says test all things and it tells us to test all prophecies. So if I feel like the Lord's telling me to tell you something, well, then I want to just... Hey, hey, I don't know, maybe it's the Lord, check it out for yourself, but I want to be faithful and try it. And then when you do that, you realize if you did that to a lost person, somebody out in the world somewhere, well, they might think you're a little deaf, and matter of fact, they'll probably be convinced you are. But at least in this place, we know that that's a place where we could try something like that. And what happens is, is we come in, and this is the problem, we get this concept that church is just a place where we just kind of come in and we absorb, and we're kind of a spectator. Some guy kind of does his dance and the thing, and maybe the music's kind of got its thing going on, and we have an experience, and then we walk away. It was kind of like we went to the spiritual petrol station. 
So we kind of got our little juice up, and then we kind of left for it, and we just hope we don't run out of fumes before the next service. <laughs> but the problem is, is that that isn't going to carry us through all of our trials. And part of it is that one of the things God requires is genuine fellowship. And fellowship can't happen if we all come in with straws. Somewhere down the line, we have to have that, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm available, Lord. Normally, we could be in a church setting, and we could hear that, and we naturally assume what that means is we have to just go out and just preach the gospel to everyone, which Jesus does call us to do, mind you. But we think that's the entirety and the absolute and the exhaustive context for all of God's ministry. Yet, let me ask you, when we start talking about the spiritual gifts, how many of them are to function to the body? Prophecy, who's that for? Teaching, who's that for? You know, when you look at these things, whether the gifts of mercy, whether the, whether, and the, the reason I said gifts of exhortation, exhortation is challenging someone to take what they know and put it into practice. What do you think you're supposed to be sharing that with? And the reason I say that is every spiritual gift God has given is to function within the body, on the body, but then there is evangelism as well to go out and reach the world. And, we, and he even says, and how's this for fun? He says, it is important to do good to all, but especially to the household of faith. Do you realize God does want us playing favorites? And I'll tell you why. Because you always play favorites with your family. And if we call each other family, you would expect that. You know, my two girls love and hate each other because they're sisters. And it would be weird if they didn't. But in it, there's still preferential treatment that they're going to get with each other because they're sisters. And we tell people, we're a we're family, but if we treat each other in no way different than the rest of the world, how exactly is this some form of identified unit to them? As a matter of fact, when Jesus separated the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25, do you remember that? It's important to recognize this because in a, a society that is so consumed with social justice, which, by the way, I, one of the things I've noticed in the last two weeks because I've had a lot of chance to observe a lot, is I've never seen a generation so consumed with social justice with the convinced that they have the right to judge on anything that seems socially unjust, but finds it preposterous that a holy God would judge them. And I'm sharing this with my 15-year-old, and she turns to me and she says, Dad, they, we find it preposterous that anybody would judge us, which makes you God in the paradigm. That's to consider. And the only reason I say all of that is is that we can get so caught up in that and we use something like Matthew 25 where Jesus separates the sheep and the goats from earlier. He says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you actually visited me. You know, because I was, and it's like, and you came to me and I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And we just look at that part and go, there we go. We need to go out there and clothe the, the naked, not, well, <laughs> to be honest, I think to be honest, if you're actually going to see the naked out there, they probably prefer, they chose that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to, you know, like, geez, put some clothes on. Uh, but, you know, it's like, you know, okay, we're going to help the homeless and we're going to feed the hungry. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but when Jesus says that, he says, what you did to the least of these, my brothers, who is that? That's the church. And it is almost astounding to me. Actually, I shouldn't say almost. It is astounding to me how we'll quickly neglect each other to try to do something out there because the world will applaud that. But everything there should have an eternal purpose as it should here. And all of that to say that in this situation, it becomes a corporation of people that have a very convenient sense of sacrifice. In other words, I'll do it on my terms, my way, how I like it, and it's inconvenient. That place is far away, that temple, that is far away, and those three required feasts of Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot. I don't have to go to those things. I mean, oh, come on, really? I mean, because if I do that, I might actually be asked to do something, but I can go on my high heel anytime I want, and I can do it however I want, and I can do it as much as I want or whatever, and not have to really sacrifice what I don't want to sacrifice. I can, I can really set up the rules. And, and that's really what's taking place here. You realize this kind of partial reformation is not reinvention as God intended. You can't put this new wine of a complete reformation of, of, of God in an old wineskin. Now the north, they were busy worshiping the wrong gods with those golden caps, but the south was busy doing the wrong worship of the right God versus worshiping the right God the right way. And this is our first hint. What is that about us? Are we at that place where you realize, all right, God, but this is the line I draw. As long as it's convenient, 
I will sacrifice. Which doesn't sound like much of a sacrifice. Verse 4, Yehosh said to the priests, All the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that the man purposes in his heart to bring to the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his own constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. Now, don't miss this. The whole point's quite simple here. This boy wants the temple repaired. I remind you, we actually don't have a particular age listed here in this text. We just know he's younger than 30 in this text. And the reason I say that is, is somewhere in that, that means he's in his late teens, early 20s, uh, according to this, then we're looking at this, he looks and he goes, man, this temple needs to be repaired. I remind you, his grandmother sacked this place. So the doors are gone, the place is all messed up. But I want to remind you, this is the place for the first six years he was tucked away and safe. This is a very special place to him. And he looks and he goes, I, there is no reason that this should be dilapidated like this. We really need to do something about it. Now in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, God said that every person is to pay a particular tax each year of a half a shekel. It's called the temple tax. So that was collected. Now since the days of David, and if you remember, David took a census he was not supposed to, to count his army to see how big and bad he was. And as a result of that, horrible things ensued. People were really nervous about being counted. So they wouldn't be counted. To this day, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel will not be counted. Let's say we're playing a game and you have to split off. What they'll say is, you're not one, you're not two, you're not three. That way you're not being counted. That's trying to actually meet the, that's That's kind of the idea. Now, so what do they do? How do they take a certain census of people? You know what they do? Every man has to bring in a half temple, a half shekel temple tax. They just count the half shekel coins. And as they count the half shekel coins, they know how many people they're dealing with. That's kind of the idea there. But with that in mind, it's important to know that money went to help, in essence, sponsor the priests, their food, their livelihood, that kind of thing, and keep them, keep them alive. And the reason I say that is he has a really great idea on his hands here. But the problem is he's, in essence, garnishing the wages of the priests to try to get it accomplished. Now, they've already, in essence, I mean, imagine, if you will, in, in, you know, and I know that if, you, if we really don't recognize it, there's always going to be a handful of very high-profile individuals out there that don't represent the world. The same way that we could say, oh, well, let's look at the Rothschilds, and let's look at the Gates, and let's look at these handful of people that are profile and go, well, and clearly everyone in America is a billionaire or everybody in the Western country, Western world is a billionaire. We know that that's a very, very small, and not even cross-section, that is the tip-top of the tip-top. But it doesn't represent us. I don't know about you. I mean, I remember walking into Sacramento, which, by the way, was the, is the capital of California, and going into the Capitol building, and it was tiled with marble and all of this, and I'm like, if this represents the people, I must represent a different people, because I don't have marble like this in my house, you know. And again, obviously, that's kind of the idea. Now, the whole point of it's this. You can look and you can say, well, what about that guy who's driving the Bentleys and he's on TV and he's got the, you know, the 4,000-pound suit on, but he's calling himself a Christian, and you can actually say that that's the baby in the bathwater. But in the end of it all, it's as much a representation of the general clergy as Bill Gates is for the general populace of, of America. It's an unfair example to use. And the reason I say that is the average guy, and I know this because we had to do this wacky thing for, to keep me in the country where I had to advertise for my quote-unquote job, which, by the way, had anyone qualified, paid to be a bit qualified, had anyone been qualified, the church would have gone under because the church has never paid me. We don't have that kind of funding. But we would have to, we had to find out what the going wage was for somebody of my, I don't know, caliber from my, someone of my calling to be able to pay an individual. And I can tell you right now, it is still two-thirds of the average, the average median income for London. In other words, they're not making more money than, the, I mean, the average guy is just happy to drive something or be able to take the tube, and he's happy to be able to put food on his, on his plate, and then more than likely shops at places like Iceland. Now, the reason I'm saying that is, is that if you garnish the wages of Bill Gates, that would be one thing. But if you garnish the wages of the average guy that's, you know, just basically trying to make a living, it's detrimental. Does that make sense? And they say, well, what about that guy? Well, then you hit him up. They've got money. In this situation like this, he goes, oh, well, we need to do a, re a, re a repair on this building. 
So I think we should kind of skim off of you guys, but those guys actually aren't making a great deal of money here. These guys aren't living large. But he's trying to come up with funds somewhere. Does that make sense? Now imagine if you will, someone going, well, you know what, we, uh, let me see, let's see. No, where are you from? Where, what area? You're in Walthamstow. Walthamstow East. East London. Yes, that is right. It's up at the top there. Walthamstow. So you're in Walthamstow. Imagine someone comes and says, you know what, we need to repair the, the high street of Walthamstow. So we're just going to go door to door, and you guys are just going to have to get this a percentage of your income. Now, that would be a bit rough for most people. Staff at Walthamstow is one of those areas that's sort of synonymous with being enormously wealthy, with all due respect. And the reason I'm saying that is, that's kind of the idea we get here. Verse 6 says, Now it was, by the 23rd year of King Jehoash, that the king had not repaired, I'm sorry, that the priest had not repaired the damages of the temple. Same thing would have happened in Walthamstow. Give us, all, give us what we need to get, let's get this thing done. It's, it's like, now, if it's the 23rd year of King Jehoash and he started at age 7, how old is he at this point? He's 30. Excellent. He's 30 years old. And by this point, he's waited and he's like, you know, I've noticed nothing's really gotten done here. And so Jehoash called Jehoiada, remember that's the high priest, and the other priest, and he said, well, why haven't you repaired the damages of the temple? Now, therefore, do not take more money from your constituency, but deliver it for the repairing of the damages of the temple. Now what he's saying is, we're going to have to come up with it a different way. Clearly, garnishing your wages isn't going to have this happen. So this is their plan B, verse 8. The priests agreed that whatever, uh, they would neither receive more money, and this is above and beyond, from the people, nor repair the damages of the temple. But yet, Haurada, the priest, took a chest. He bored a hole in its lid, and he set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. In other words, we call this a Yehoiada chest. In other words, he's like, look it. It's a free will offering, just like when we built the tabernacle. You give because you want to give. And there's just a whole, nobody gets to actually really promote how much they've given. If you want, there's a box. We, by the way, we've done that since, well, actually, say, I can't say we've done that since the beginning of our time planning a church. The first year we actually planted our church in Central California, we didn't even allow people to give. Until I was rebuked by a pastor from Hawaii. You know you're in trouble when you get rebuked from a guy like say, aloha, bro. <laughs> it's like nobody, you know. This is like whatever, and everything's like pigeon, and it's like mellow, and it's cool, and this guy's like, you know, you're robbing guys the opportunity, man. The opportunity to be a blessing, and I had never thought of it that way. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll put a box out. And it's, it's, uh, it's all we've ever done. We've never passed it, nor ever will we. And that's what Yehoiada does. He goes, like, look at You guys want to see this thing fixed up? There's the box in the back. Go take care of it. And what it says, by the way, according to Second Chronicles, the parallel text of this, for chapter 24, is that people actually filled it up so much they had emptied every day. And by the way, it wasn't just one guy. One guy never checked it. We do the same thing. There was always accountability. Two guys are going to peek in, and one guy's, one guy's a scribe. He's going to write down how much it is. Another guy's going to be there to make sure that nobody's skimming off the top. Because when a guy's collecting money and skimming off the top, there is one guy in the New Testament who's doing that. Do you know who that is? Judas Iscariot. That's what it says about him. He kept the money back, so he used to skim off the top. All right. So it was when they saw that there was much money in the chest, things were getting clogged at the top, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags, counted the money, and it was found in the house of the Lord. So they gave the money, which had been apportioned, into the hands of those who did the work, who had oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it into the car to the carpenters and the builders, Okay, if it's carpenters and builders, what part are you fixing of the temple? The roof? Yeah, the structure. The structure. You know, it's like, think about it. You're like, carpenters, these are the framers. The, and I remind you, stonemasons and stonecutters, they're the ones, that's the entire wall. To this day, there is a requirement that everything in Jerusalem be covered in limestone. It's a city of white. The reason I say that is this becomes our other point here. Well, here, read it with me first so you see what I'm saying. So, they paid it out to the carpenters and builders who worked on the house of the Lord. In other words, they paid the, the contractors directly. And then the masons and stonecutters for buying timber and hewn stone to repair damage of the house of the Lord for all that was paid out to repair the temple. However, there was not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, any articles of gold or silver here from the money brought into the house of the Lord. <coughs> 
And wait a minute, what's all that stuff? That's the actual service stuff on the inside. The second thing about a temporary revival, if you will, or a temporary reformation, is it's all about the outside, but not the inside. And this is how things don't last. Because we want to fix the outside. And you know, it takes that sometimes for us to want to get fixed. But I've learned this in the culture we're at, especially if you get nine minutes, you know, is, and I, and I, pray, for, I pray for the GPs and the work that they have to do and the, the prognosis that they have to give in nine minutes. It's just got to be rough on rough. But you get so busy, sometimes all you can do is treat the symptoms, but nobody gets cured. I've got a rash. Oh, we know how to deal with a rash. I've got this ache. Oh, we know how to deal with an ache. I've got this problem. Well, I think we know how to deal with the problem. So what happens is we're applying ointment to a rash, but we're not dealing with what caused the rash. And this isn't an indictment on medicine. We do the same thing. But the problem is, let's face it, if someone, unless there are symptoms, nobody goes to the doctor to be fixed. Is that fair? But what happens is, we just kind of want the symptoms gone. And as long as the symptoms aren't there, we'll actually be happy to be diagnosed with something as long as it doesn't create something to limit us. And so somewhere down the line, something happens on the outside that is emblematic of something on the inside. You know what it looks like? You lose your temper. And whatever that means. And by the way, all that means is balance, if you think about it. Well, however you've lost your balance. You, you find yourself going back to an old habit. You get consumed by things you thought you were free from. Things like jealousy, or lust, or anger, or insecurity. Pride. And you're like, but I'm a Christian. How in the world can this possibly happen? I don't get it. Am I not supposed to live this totally free life? God, would you take away my outbursts of wrath? Would you take away the way that I've fallen in this particular direction? I don't like it, but what you want to do in the end of it all, and here's the difference. Let me say it this way. Do you hate the sin or the consequence? Because the difference is radical. A guy cheats on his wife. His wife hates him for it. It's fairly reasonable. The kids now can't look at dad the same way. It's reasonable under the circumstances. And he hates the circumstances. It's reasonable. But does he hate the sin? If in time, he may be restored. Not always, but he may be. Maybe not to the degree, but his wife will forgive children won't get past it to some degree, though there will always be a chink in there somewhere. And if all you hate are the circumstances, you'll go back to the sin and stay messy. And if what you really want is just to get rid of a couple symptoms, you never get cured. And it takes a really caring individual to actually go past the symptom, to go, all right, what's the core of this? Because wouldn't it be great if this never came back? Wouldn't it be great if this really, that symptom is a warning sign that something needs to change inside. I remind you, we started with convenient religion here, convenient sacrifice. And we went from convenient sacrifice where it's sort of I make the rules to this place where now I set the tone on the exterior and as long as the exterior is good, we're good. But God doesn't judge on the exterior, does he? He says, man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, the lava of the inside. So you know what happens? We learn to do what the Pharisees did. We pray long and loud. We do our tongues. We have our things. We spin around in circles. We, we praise loud and we fall on our faces and we do all of these things and we have these great emotional moments at best. But our house is still vacant on the inside. And let me just say, it all started with this fundamental statement that this kid was just fine as long as this other person was around. In other words, he never had that intimate, personal connection that he was supposed to have. It was always through, and we could do that through a church, we could do it through a pastor, we could do it through a friend, we could do it through a parent. But no matter what that thing is in between, if unless it's there to introduce and get out of the way, as John would say, he must increase, I must decrease, 
it's going to be sooner or later detrimental to your walk. So however, those things were not made. But as far as the workmen, verse 14, they gave it to the workers, they repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, they didn't even require account from the men under the hand and they delivered the money to be paid to workmen for they dealt faithfully. Now, could you imagine? It's like you just give a chunk of cash to a guy that's like a plumber. Or and it's like I think Adams had to work with a lot of those kind of guys and stuff. You know, it's like, yeah, you're an electrician. Well, here's you know, here's my car, here's my credit card. You just go for it, and I'll just check in on you in a week. Wow, could you imagine? Apparently, that's the case here, though. Verse 16. But the money of the trespass offering and the money from the sin offerings that was brought into the house of the Lord, it belonged to the priest. In other words, God was not going to neglect the priests to make sure this was going to get done. You don't hurt other people to help something else. Now. Our last part of this, verse 17. Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it, and Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Now, in this particular story, it just seems like we just did, a, it's like you almost got whiplash, didn't you? They're repairing, they're repairing the temple, granted not everything, and they're trying to do some form of reformation among the, among the peoples, and all of a sudden this guy comes out of nowhere and attacks him from Syria. Well, guess what happened in between these two moments? Yehoiada died. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 15, it says this. Yehoiada grew old, which I find interesting because he started at 100 and apparently he grew old after that. I'd be on it. The older I get, the more I draw comfort from it. Yehoiada grew old and was full of days and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. And this is what happened after that. 2 Chronicles 24, 17 says this. After the death of Yehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king and the king listened to them. Therefore they left the house of the Lord God and their fathers and served wooden images and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of the trespass. And yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord and they testified against them, but they would not listen. And this is how bad it gets. Now, don't miss this for a second because what you find is this guy followed Yehoiada and that was great as a good influence, but what happened is he didn't grow out of it, but instead what he did is he just went on the market for the next influence, but the next influence was a bad one. And a person that can be, if you're the kind that's easily influenced, now that's not everyone, but if you are, I beg you, be extremely, then find somebody that you can trust that can help you sift through who's going to be your influences. Because what's going to happen is, bad influences are still influences. So this guy that was influenced so well, what you find is, somehow it didn't leave a lasting legacy. So now he's just influenced by a bad batch of guys. And now they're building another false temple, people are bowing down to idols, and let me tell you how bad it gets. Remember how God says here that he sent prophets to warn them? Hey, when you start getting off on God, and he's like, look at, remember, this is about a relationship, and you start veering from that, he will send people into your life to tell you, hey, what your choices you're making are stupid. What are you going to do with people like that? By the way, the prophet Joel shows up about this particular period of time. He shows up and goes, man, what are you doing? There's a day of the Lord coming. You might want to get right. But what's worse to me than that is Yehoiada. Remember the guy that raised him? He has a son, and his son's name is Zechariah, or we might say Zechariah. But Zechariah, his son, was a prophet. And Zechariah actually, which by the way means God is remembered, comes up to this king that was seven, that's now an adult, and he goes, what are you doing? How could you possibly leave the living God to be able to do all of this? This is nonsense. What's wrong with you? And you know what Yehosh does as a result of that? He has this guy stoned to death right there in the temple precinct in the courtyard. This is the son of the guy that saved his life, that rescued him and raised him those first six years. And he kills his son? And as that guy's being stoned to death, you know, he says, look on this and repay it. And Yehoiada, by the way, the guy's dad, the one who raised him, is buried, by the way, once he dies in, in, the, in the tombs of the kings in the city of David. But this king will not be buried in the tombs of the kings. So the king doesn't get buried where kings get buried, though it's in the city of David. But this prophet who's not a king gets buried there. Why? Because he did a better job than the king did. If that's any confusing at all. Now, let's close this up. So what happens at the end of this? He turns his back on God, and guess what happens? Syria starts to invade. That's how this works. Now, this Hatzael, by the way, I remember you killed the king that was previous. His name was Ben-Hadad. And this is how messed up he is. He has a son, and he names him after the king he killed. Boy, that's messed up. 
That just tells you, man, this is the kind of stuff that sounds like any sort of crowned history. And it just gets crazy. So, Hazael, the king of Syria, for the sake of clarity, let's close this up, uh, went up and fought against Gat. Gat, by the way, is 35 miles. It's still to this day Gat. It means press. Remember, Goliath was the champion of Gath. Gat, that's this. And he went up against Gath. He took it, and Hazael set his face toward Jerusalem. Yehoash, now, Syria comes with, by the way, Second Chronicles says a really small army, but God grants him a victory over an enormous Israeli army at the moment. Verse 18, Yehoash, the king of Judah, took all the sacred things of his fathers, Yehoshaphat, Yehoram, and Ahaziah, kings of Judah, had dedicated his own sacred things, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and in the king's house, and he sent them to Hatzel, king of Syria, and then he went away from Jerusalem. Thus he went away. So you know what he did, right? Because he just bought off his assailant. You got that, right? But what did he have to do that? He had to do actually what grandma did. He sacked the temple to actually do this. And four generations of accumulated wealth go to this guy that's attacking. Why is that so important? Because this is exactly what's going to happen in your life. The enemy wants to make your life miserable. But the problem is he can't get at you. And you don't believe me? Read 1 John chapter 5. It says, whoever has been born of God keeps himself. The wicked one does not touch him. You want to run from God? God wants you miserable running from him. Because he wants you. He created you to be with him. And he doesn't want you happy and comfortable away from him. Because it's not what you were created for. And you see Saul's life. If you remember the one who preceded David. His life was a life of abject misery. Because he would not abrogate the throne. And let God take it like he should. And he was miserable and died that way. So hear me on this. All of a sudden, you've, you've like veered from God. Now, here's the dangerous thing. You veered from God at a time when it looks like revival's taking place. Did you notice that? The temple's being rebuilt. People are kind of coming back. And it looks good, but inside, this guy is off wandering, checking out these wooden idols and all of these other things. And the reason I said that is you can fool everyone but you and God. And you can hallelujah all you want. And people will go, oh, man, you are so spirit-filled. When you start running from God, you start getting worked. And what the enemy wants are your goods. Because if you can take your goods, you won't have much to offer. Let me tell you what I mean. He wants to take your boldness. But when you're in love with God, you know... When you see a guy in love, there's two things I notice. One is he can't shut up and mention that girl's name. He just keeps talking. It's like, no matter what it is. Someone gets hit by a car, and you're like, well, that person might die. And you think, you know, that reminds me of my girlfriend. That reminds me of so-and-so, because it's just my heart feels like that. It's just amazing. Everything kind of winds up back there. There's a boldness that comes with love that isn't contrived. It just happens. Remember when you were so in love with God, you couldn't stop saying the name Jesus? And what happens is you're like, you know what? I'm starting to get work now. If I could just mellow out on that, then maybe the, the intensity will stop. Isn't that what he's doing? If I can just give the goods up, then the battle will ease. But the battle happened in the first place because he turned from God. Not because he was getting work. That was the product of it. So Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. But let me tell you else, what else he wants to take. He wants to take your truth. If you could just actually not play absolutes, even though you know Scripture says it, well, you won't lose friends. You'll get less persecuted. It'll be less tense. So people say, do you really believe? You know what I've noticed? I've been around the block a few times. And when people ask, do you really believe? Many of those people really want you to say yes. They want to see somebody with a backbone. Because there are people who believe absolute and abject nonsense out there, and you and I both know it, that will actually stand up and say, yeah, actually, I believe that. And we won't. And we actually do believe this stuff is true because it is true. Do you really believe God did that? Do you really believe this is how it went about? Do you believe this is God created it this way? Or do you believe this is... Do you, I mean, do you really believe that the world was covered in water? Yeah, I do. Well, you're an idiot. Well, do you believe that there was an ice age? Sure. And the whole world was covered in ice? Sure. What's water made out of? I'm sorry, what's ice made out of? 
Don't we both believe the world was covered in water? It's just amazing. That, you know, and the whole point of it is this. If the enemy could stop you from holding on to the truth, you'll have no footing anymore. And you're like, well, things will ease up, right? You know what else the enemy really wants? He wants your joy. Not happiness. He'll trade you. Happiness comes by happenings. Same root word. The idea of his circumstances. And so when someone asks, what's it like to be a Christian? You're like, it's like up and down. It's like a roller coaster. It's like being on a lift. No, that's not true. It's actually, that's what it's like to live life without God. Because circumstances are good and bad, and they dictate whether you're happy or not. But joy is in God's presence, and His presence is the fullness of joy, and that should never be a variable. And you realize, when people, when we actually talk, well, yeah, today's a really bad day. It doesn't mean the circumstances can't be adverse, and they can't affect you, but you can still have a peace and a joy that comes with that. But the enemy says, oh, no, 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 let's take our focus off of that, because we both know, Nehemiah 8.10, when it says that the joy of the Lord is your strength, and that means you're going to be weak and you have no footing and you have no boldness and you don't even know what you stand for. And I mean, I was just stepping into the octagon that way. I fought competitively for a while. And it's like, you've got to know what you stand for. You've got to know what your artillery is. You've got to have footing and you've got to have strength or you're going to get worked. And I think we learn a lot from this guy. Because this whole thing was partial and exterior and convenient. When the battle came, he just gave up whatever he had to to stop it. Are you going to do that? But if you can't stand for what you love, you might want to question what you love. So it ends this way. See, by the way, here's the worst part is it seemed to work. Do you think he's gone for good? I know. The rest of the acts of Yoash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Remember I was referring to 2 Chronicles? That's what he's talking about. And his servants arose and formed a conspiracy and killed Yoash in the house of Milo, which goes down to Silla. Do you know why they killed him? Because he killed Yehoiada, the high priest's son. And so they're like, well, you killed my brother, prepare to die. So Yotzekar, which by the way, his name literally means God remembers, the son of Shemir, and Yehozabad, which means God has given or endowed the son of Shomer, his son struck him. So he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Now we read in the Chronicles. <coughs> that his son of reigned in his place. This is how we close this out tonight. There is a guy who from the outside would have been really great for quite a bit of time, as long as, as Yehoiada was alive. And as long as you're with your crew, as long as you're with your posse, as long as you're in church, as long as whatever that setting, that thing is, you're good. But the moment it's gone, it's gone, you're in trouble. Jesus did not die for you to take group reservations. And he's not into timeshare. He calls his sheep by name. Aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't do that? <laughs> Contrary to what traditions people want to put out there, Jesus did not say, I died for you now. If you want to talk to me, you have to talk through my mom. Or you have to talk through a dead saint in Italy somewhere that you've never <coughs> met. You know, it, it, That's just absolute and in, in acute nonsense when Jesus died to be with you. Do you even realize, do you realize that's what this is all about? So we fix the outside like whitewashed tombs. We'll learn to make our phylacteries large and our prayers long. We like to stand on our street corners. If the street corner is one, more people will applaud us for it. Let's face it. If we stood on our street corner like Tottenham Court Road, it would be a very different experience than we stood on the street corner in the middle of church. But we know how to play the role. And we play it dexterously. But God looks at the inside and what he sees is it's still in room. All the washing bowls, all the real sacrifice is gone. Because real sacrifice is not convenient. And it's not cheap. But the other thing I noticed, remember when I said there's two things you notice when the guy's in love? Is not only that he can't stop talking about her name. The second is he takes he does he takes out the one thing you'd never see a guy take out for any other reason. His wallet. When you watch a guy take out his wallet and he's quick to spend it on a girl, it's fairly likely that guy's in love. And the only reason I say that is because it just doesn't matter. What good is it anyways, what he has, if it isn't going to bless the person that he loves? Isn't it amazing when we talk about God and we're like, God, what do you really want from me? I'm afraid you're going to want my stuff. 
<laughs> Sounds like a really weird relationship, doesn't it? God, but what if? What if they give up all my money and live in a leper colony? If I, first of all, you'd be hard pressed to find one. No, there are there out there. The whole point is, is imagine it's like, hey, before we start going out, are you going to want my guitars? That'd be kind of a weird place to start. Because I just want to make sure that we know that if this doesn't work out, I don't want you taking my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you have a right to be insulted by that. So I'll end with a quick story and I want to pray. Do you know that my wife was the first girl I ever asked out in my life? Do you know that? I was 24 years old. Now, kind of the rock and roll world, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you, you meet people and you're like ships bumping. But I never asked a girl out. I came from a really tumultuous background. My family life was really messed up. And, um, but the Lord consumed me with this girl. She was miserable and she was grounded in Christ and it just didn't make sense. And finally the Lord said, and we were, I mean, she was the assistant to a director for a movie and I was writing the soundtrack for it. So we had a business relationship, a professional relationship. But now I'm going to bust through all of that. No, I had just started falling in love with God. I started reading scripture. And I didn't see anywhere in there how to ask a girl out, according to the Bible. I give her a call on the phone. Hey, Suzanne, this is Tony. Would you like to go see a movie? And my wife said, no. Matter of fact, nonchalant, no emotion. Now, I, I recoil for a second and I realize, oh, maybe she just doesn't want to see a movie. It's dark. Would you like to go for a walk on the beach? No. Now, up to that point, I'll be honest, I hadn't really given it much thought, but I thought, well, you know, if you never ask anyone out, you could always say, well, they probably would have said yes. The only girl I ask out says no twice. And then I'm like, I get it. God, this was to humble me. This was to humble me so that I wouldn't get distracted in my pursuit of you. I get it. All right, we're cool. I thought I'd figure God out. Now I'm just trying to hang out the phone if there's any dignity left hanging on me anywhere. All right, cool. Uh, talk to you on the set. Yeah, cool. The phone is away from my ear. And Suzanne says, hold on, hold on. Hey, you're a nice guy and I like you. But this is going to end up in marriage or it's not going anywhere. That was infinitely harder to hear than the no. My voice started cracking like a pubescent child. I'm like, what? And I'm like, how do you answer that? And I, and I mean, and she had been engaged in such four different times. She had been within. She had been basically in the hallway of marriage, and it never worked out. And now here I am, sort of number five. And so now that I got listen, God just told me to ask you out. Okay, I'm just trying to be obedient. I can use your help. The whole point of it is this. I love, in retrospect that she knew that if I was going to pursue her, this is what it was going to look like. It was going to look like marriage. No games being played. This is the end of it all. Then you read scripture. Jesus being the bridegroom, me being the bride. It's like, this isn't about playing around. Like, this is going to end up in marriage. This is going to end up with you, part of my family. You're going to be engulfed in my love for eternity. That's where this ends up. It's not playing games with that. If you want to just fix the externals and all of that stuff, well, that's one thing. But God has a greater plan than that. So as you go to prayer, let me say this. I want to remind you, God's always the one who pays the bill. Jesus dying on the cross was so that none of us have to stand guilty before him because it's the one thing between us and him is our guilt. And God says, I'll tell you what, if I pay the bill, will you come? So the only thing left is your pride and your sense of choice, your free will. And no matter what you want to kind of reason, however you want to play with that, in the end of it all, you can say, no, I think I'll pay that bill myself. Or I'll try to renegotiate the terms of it. 
But why in the world would anyone reasonably do that when God's already paid the bill by sending his son to die? Now, how do I know it was good enough? Well, just the same way on Yom Kippur, the one day when the high priest goes in and pays and offers a sacrifice for the people, him coming out alive again proves that the sacrifice was accepted. And then the same way Jesus went and he took all of our guilt, nailed it on the cross, was buried, and then he came out alive again to say, price has been paid to tell us that it's painful. I just want to ask, have you accepted that gift? That's the, the, the dignity of choice God gives you. And you have that choice to make. But if you have said yes, what if we ask God today to take us beyond the outer shell to the place of being a total, absolute reinvention and not just a reformation of the outside? Because that's what you really want. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, I recognize that Judas had everyone fooled, except you. Jesus, when you said, one of you will, be, will betray me, they look around at each other wondering who it could be. And for all of the, the crimes and the thieveries of his heart, nobody seemed to have actually mentioned Judas. And in that same way, we can fool everyone. We can learn how to save the stuff, raise our hands, sing the songs. We can learn how to have experiences. But it's all on the outside. It's all among other people, but not alone with you. It's whitewashed tombs. But Jesus, you didn't just want a relationship with the shell, with the tent that's temporary. You wanted a relationship with all of us. So much so that you would give everything to have us. There was no external dumb show for you to get us. Jesus, you died on a cross to have that pain for all of the crimes of the hearts and minds of every human being would be laid upon you so that any human being in history could say yes to your bill paying, to your offer. But it's so much more than just clearing the debt. It's us surrendering ourselves to you to be the architect of our reinvention, not just our redecorator, not just our restorer, but our reinventor. And here in the sanctity of this room, we just want to tell you, God, that we would like you to do so much more than fix the external problems, the, the leaks of the roof, the crumbling door frame. But you fix us from the inside out. That our hearts would crave you like you crave us. We recognize love is greater shown and greatest shown in sacrifice. And the greater the sacrifice, the greater love demonstrated. And you tell us no greater love could be demonstrated than this, that a man would give his life for his friends. And I recognize that is the greatest sacrifice. And that's the sacrifice you gave to us to show us how much you love us. To redeem us out of that filth and debt. And so... Tonight we ask that you take us beyond convenient Christianity. We pray that you would take us beyond sort of external displays. And that there would be nothing in between us. Even good things. Because good things between us aren't good things anymore but that we would have that intimate and personal relationship with you that you invented us in the first place to have. And if you recognize that this is a choice you would like to make or you recognize this is something that you really have to consider, I would encourage you to make that choice. But it is simple as a prayer as saying, God, I recognize you paid my price with Jesus at the cross. You died for my sins, my guilt. And you rose again to give me new life. 
when I say yes to your payment, when I hand my life to you to be reinvented. And if that's you, just pray this prayer with me right now. God, I make that choice. I recognize you sent Jesus to pay for my guilt, my sin. He died and was buried. And he rose again to give me new life. And so, I hand my life to you to be reinvented now. Make me yours. Engulf me in that love you speak of. And take me on from the inside out. Transform me now, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.